good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the 12th CEO Institute Annual Summit. For those who don't know me, my name's Neil Rapley and I'm the director of the Institute for the New South Wales region. It's great to see so many familiar faces given I've not been here very long, about six months now. Um, some of you in the room were here at the first summit in 2008. Others of you have attended several in the, over the past few years and for the rest, like me, you're uh, experiencing this for the first time. But regardless, I'm hoping that there'll be something for everyone to take away and some new business contacts are made. Creating an event that engages and inspires is challenging to self-fund and therefore sponsorship support is vital. This year, I'm very pleased to say that every one of our sponsors holds memberships within the Institute um, and we'll be hearing from a few of them later and it's really great to be promoting our own. So firstly, to our returning national partner, Pronto Software, an Australian developer of award-winning ERP manage, uh, business management software. As always, thanks for your support, Chad, Frank, and the team. <laughs> Another returning event partner, Maserati. Constructed with the utmost attention to detail, every Maserati is a true masterpiece of Italian car design. Thanks, Glenn, and it's always a great pleasure to see some of your cu fine cars on display. <laughs> and a big thanks goes out to a couple of brand new sponsors at this event too. The first is King Living, a high-end Australian furniture designer and manufacturer who have also kindly provided some beautiful stage and lounge furniture for us today. Thanks Anna and thanks to Harry. <laughs> Secondly, but by no means least, Chris and his team at the Information Management Group, or TIMG, have provided us with our coffee today. TIMG makes work life simpler by helping you store, manage, integrate and access your important data securely, compliantly and effortlessly. And finally, Vinnie's. This year we'll be kicking off our new national charity partnership with the Vinnie's CEO Sleepout. Some here today have supported this worthy cause in the past and there'll be more detail about this new relationship in the coming weeks at forthcoming syndicate meetings. Kat from the New South Wales Sleepout team is here today. She's just outside in the foyer. She'd be happy to answer any questions and maybe get a few more sign-ups before the end of the day. So look, after a lot of planning, organising and preparing, the day has finally arrived. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait to hear from the array of exceptional speakers around our theme, The Bigger Picture, and with a particular focus on the future of work. Whilst this theme is by no means unique, it does remain relevant. Advances in technology are continuing at a quickening pace, and something that took 10 years to develop in the past will take considerably less time in the future. We are now just a few short months away from the start of the third decade of the new millennium. That came about quickly. Uh, so before we kick off the day proper, I thought we'd take a quick look back at the world we lived in at the beginning of its first decade. And its relevance to business is quite profound in most cases. And for the others, it's just a bit of nostalgic fun. In the short term, the things we view, such as how we see ourselves in the mirror on a daily basis, don't seem to alter that much. But when you go back a decade or two, it is quite amazing to see just how different our lives were then and just how different most of us looked. So to the year 2000, let's start with mobile phones. And at the time, that name perfectly described what it was, a device for making or taking calls on the go. Simple. Phone manufacturers were designing smaller and smaller devices, and back then many of us had a particular brand of phone from a certain country in Scandinavia. Well, today, of course, our mobiles, or more commonly referred to as smartphones, are getting bigger and bigger. The significant players in the device market now hail from the US and South Korea. Perhaps the, t the term phone itself needs to be revised because we see people using their phones far more frequently for activities other than making calls, and now a screenless world of voice automation is being suggested as the future. And that is a great segue into me saying, please make sure your phones are on silent. Back in 2000, most of us would have carried a paper-based street directory or a road map in our car. I remember the days of driving between appointments and having to find somewhere to keep pulling over to refer to my map to see where I was going. Or even pulling over and asking someone for directions. When did you last do that? 
Since then, we have seen portable sat-navs sweep the market and then largely disappear again. Many budget-priced car manufacturers now have added them to their list of standard equipment, and today we have map apps on our portable devices with seamless updates and revisions. Some of the most well-known, though not necessarily biggest firms in the world today, weren't even a twinkle in their daddy's eye in 2000. Think companies like Facebook. They started in 2004. LinkedIn, 2002. Uber, 2009. YouTube, 2005. Wikipedia, 2001, and Tesla, 2003. And then there is the online shopping revolution, which didn't really exist to the masses in the year 2000. Today it's everywhere, and traditional retailers have had to adapt or else face the possibility of extinction. Now, who remembers the good old-fashioned checkbook? Still a common payment practice in the year 2000. Now it's all tap and go and online banking. Whatever next. If you used words like streaming, tweeting, tablet, apps, cloud, social media, even iPod, in conversations in 2000, the context in which those words could be used would be very different to today. Either that or you'd get some pretty blank expressions on people's faces. And talking of iPods, they arrived in 2001. They conquered the world and then became almost obsolete all within less than two decades. New sales of CDs and DVDs are declining fast, and video stores, or as my son affectionately called them, show shops, have also gone, replaced by Netflix, Stan, Spotify, and a multitude of over-the-top content providers. Interestingly, though, there's been a resurgence in LP vinyl record sales, so I guess progress is not an exact science. Whether we are the pioneers in our chosen field, the early adopters, or living in the false hope that nothing really changes, I sincerely hope that as a result of today's event, we can all find something of value, something that resonates, something that prompts us to rethink or influence our future plans, to make a positive difference in how we adapt to an ever-changing world. Because it will change, and faster than ever before. And to me, that's exciting, if not a bit scary as well. And the funny thing is we could look back in 10 years' time to today, to this very moment in time, with the same amazement that we have done about the year 2000. Just think about that. And so, to all our members, our syndicate chairs, our guests, our speakers, thank you all for making the time to be here today. Now, make yourself comfortable as I introduce our MC. Our MC has had an incredibly varied and successful media career. It is most effectively summarised this way. When you were young and trendy, you may have woken up with him on Triple J Radio. When you were more mature and sophisticated, you may have woken up with him on ABC Sydney. And if you took an extra long Christmas holiday this year, you may have fallen asleep on the couch with him as he hosted ABC's The Drum Over Summer. He's also proudly one of Australia's best-known maths nerds, and his best, latest bestseller is called Adam Spencer's Top 100 and he has generously agreed to give away several autographed copies throughout today's proceedings. Please join me in giving a big, warm welcome to Adam Spencer. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you very much, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Yes, indeed, it is the 12th annual CEO Summit presented by CEO Institute New South Wales. I thank you for that warm welcome, Neil. My name is Adam Spencer. I'm thrilled to be here. Quick show of hands if it is your first CEO Summit. Hands in the air. How about a big round of applause for all our new attendees? Wonderful to see you here. And uh, as trite as it may say, we, we, re we really are this year bigger and better than ever. Our list of speakers has to be seen to be believed. So let's have a quick look at them right now. Look at that, hey? We're not mucking around here today, all smiling, all happy, all ready to tell you the way it is and throw some truth bombs down today at the CEO Summit. A little bit of housekeeping to get us started. Lovely venue here at the Hyatt Regency. Uh, this room, of course, is a non-smoking venue. Can't smoke here in the ballroom, can't smoke in the foyer immediately outside, can't smoke in the area down, can't smoke in the foyer of the hotel, um, can't smoke on the street immediately outside. The, um, if you want to have a cigarette today, the best thing to do is get up from your table, go out through the doors you just entered through, go down the little ramp there on the right, turn left, you'll come to the escalators, go down the escalators, you turn down there into the foyer of the hotel, go out, exit the hotel at Sussex Street, across the other side, about 50 metres down on the left, is a cab rank, go down, get a cab, um, go to the International Airport, 
buy yourself a ticket to Bali, and once you land in Denpasar, you can knock yourself out with the cigarettes, okay? Phones, please turn them to silent, but do, yeah, thank you very much, sir. Um, please keep your phones on throughout the day, because in particular, that's how you're gonna access the conference app, here. So throughout the day, I'm gonna ask a series of questions. Some of them mathematical, some of them just general trivia, and the first few correct answers that are tweeted with the hashtags CO Summit and hashtag Top 100, at the end of the day, I'll we'll get a personalised, signed copy of my books. Open up Twitter. Your first Top 100 quiz question today. The first few answers I see on Twitter that are correct to this will win themselves a prize. Here is the question, and you'll see there at the top. Make sure you include those two hashtags, CEO Summit and Top 100. Which country had a flag that was entirely white for a 16-year period at some stage in its history? Which country had an entirely white flag for a 16 year period. Tweet your answer to that, or your random guess to that, with the hashtag CEO Summit and Top 100 connected. And the first few correct answers that I see will win a signed copy of my book in the end of the day. Now during the morning, if it all gets too much for you at any stage, you can kick back in the King Living Lounge in the back corner. I already see a couple of people relaxing up there. And if you like to relax like that full time, the good people at King Living have supplied us with five $1,000 vouchers that can be used in their stores, okay? So five $1,000 King Living vouchers will be won by the people in the room today. There are two ways to win. At midday, via the app, you'll receive a sort of scratchy text. Just scratch away and you go in the draw to win. Or drop your business cards into the boxes in the back corner there in the King Living Lounge. And at lunchtime, we will draw two winning cards. So we'll announce all five winners of the Scratchy and the business card for $1,000 King Living vouchers at lunch today. Here's the small print. Have to be in the room at lunch to win and have to be a member of the CEO Institute uh, to claim any of today's book or voucher prizes. Okay, let's meet our first speaker. He is Chief Spokesperson for HSBC on forecasts and trends for the Australian and New Zealand economy. And when I say spokesperson, he doesn't muck around. You would have seen his face or read his words on too many outlets for me to list. Suffice to say, he's one of Australia's best known economic commentators. Prior to joining HSBC in 2010, he spent 12 years as an economist at the Reserve Bank of Australia. He's an adjunct professor at Curtin University and a member of the Australian National University, ANU's Shadow Reserve Bank Board. I'm not exactly sure what a Shadow Reserve Bank Board member does. I presume it means if anyone from the Reserve Bank pulls a hammy, on the big day. Uh, Paul or someone else like that just hops up off the bench and runs on to cover for them. If time allows, we will ask a few questions at the end. So tweet away, hashtag CEO Summit. Any questions you've got for our speaker, we'll squeeze in as many of those as we can at the end of his presentation. Making his fourth appearance at CEO Summit, please a big round of applause for Paul Bloxham. Good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and thank you very much for that, for that introduction. Um, it's even more of a pleasure to be a repeat performer. I've been here now, I think, as, as Adam said, the fourth time. Um, so that's great to hear. It's great when I get invited back. It means you liked what you heard the previous time. Um, and it's also good that it keeps me to account. Often I go to these presentations and people will pipe up in the question session, say, well, last year you said that the Aussie dollar was going to be here and GDP growth was going to do this and so on and so on. So I encourage that. I think that's fine. It's great that you do keep me to account. So when I had a look back, at what I said when I was here a year ago. I, you know, some of the things are right, some of the things haven't turned out quite, as, uh, quite the same. But the broad story that I delivered was actually that the global economy was doing quite well, uh, that that was going to be relatively supportive for the local economy, for Australia. I talked about some risks, particularly around trade policy. That was already becoming a, a very prominent feature, even in the, in the early part of, of 2018. And we talked about the fact that Australia's growth, we thought, would run at a bit over 3%. We were forecasting 3.2. At the moment, we're still forecasting, or we're still of the view that last year's growth was running at about 3%. So I think we got the growth story approximately right. And the global economy actually did pretty well last year. Uh, global growth held up quite well. It was a similar rate in 2018 to what we'd seen in 2017, which, is which had actually been above trend and quite strong growth. 
Uh, we talked about the fact that the housing market was cooling, and the housing market has been cooling. It's cooling faster than we had thought. Things have, have weakened more than we, we had thought. And we talked about the fact that we thought wages growth would pick up. And indeed, wages growth is picking up. But again, it's not picking up quite as much as we had expected. So those two aspects of the story are a little bit different. That left the RBA on hold. They've left their policy rate steady. And we've heard from them this week. And they're now talking about the idea that actually their next rate move could be up or it could be down. They're not quite sure because of what's going on globally. So, so that's where we stand. I think last year when I was here, we, as I say, we were reasonably optimistic about the global growth story and the local one. And that turned out to be the right position to be, I think, broadly speaking, for, for 2018. Um, but we're facing some more challenges this year. Uh, and the way we're thinking about this year is through this idea of navigating rougher seas. Uh, the main story there is a global one. So global growth, as I've just described, was actually quite strong in 2017. 2017, we had broad-based growth. It was happening across the regions, and we celebrated. In early 18, the, the economists across the world were all saying, actually, this is the strongest growth we've seen in the post-global financial crisis period. And there was momentum, and it was happening in Europe. It was happening in the US. It was happening in Asia as well. It was lifting global trade. And then we came into early 18, and that momentum was still there, as I'm describing. And actually, for 2018 as a whole, as a whole, global growth ran at a similar rate to 17, right? Global growth in 2017 was 3%. In 2018, it looks as though, looking, we've got almost all of the numbers, it looks as though it ran at 2.9. So global growth was actually holding up quite well. But what happened through 2018 was that we got this divergence of performance across the world. The world wasn't growing in an even sort of way. The US economy actually accelerated, picked up pace. Last year, the US economy grew by 3% which is extraordinarily strong. The, 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 US, the US economy was growing at a well above trend pace. If you want another statistic to carry around, at the tail end of last year, the unemployment rate in the US fell to 3.7%. It's recently lifted to 3.9%, but at 3.7%, it was at its lowest level in 49 years. So the US economy was growing well above trend, and the unemployment rate was, all, it was at its lowest level in almost five decades last year. So, so US growth actually picked up pace through 18 and that supported global growth. But the rest of the global economy started to slow down. China's growth slowed a bit, Europe's growth has slowed, and then in the second half of last year, it really slowed a lot more, more precipitously. We're now learning that Italy has fallen into a recession in the past couple of quarters. Uh, Germany's growth has slowed down as well. Uh, and we've watched China, as I say, through last year, it, it was slowing down too. So although the overall growth story last year was that global growth held up quite well, we've seen this divergence going on. And as we look into 2019, and we look further forward into 2020, we expect that global growth will actually slow a bit further. We think that last year at 2.9, it'll slow to 2.6 this year, and then 2.4. You can hear from these sorts of numbers, or I'll explain to you for these, with these sorts of numbers, we're not forecasting a global recession or a sharp downturn, but we are forecasting an easing in, in global growth. And that is a more challenging position for Australia. Because Australia is a medium-sized open economy, we are highly dependent on our trade with the rest of the world and open financial flows, and so we rely and we ride the waves that the global economy delivers. The theme, for what it's worth, last year when I put up this set of slides, it said, surf's up, because we were riding that wave of the global surf. We were riding this wave of growth, and now the story's gotten a little bit weaker. The global story's a bit more challenging, and that presents Australia with some more challenges as well, in addition to the local ones, which I'll talk about a little bit more. But on the global story, it's worth also recalling why it is that global growth is slowing. What's going on? Why has global growth slowed down? And there are three key things. There are lots of others. I mean, there are idiosyncratic things going on, like Brexit. Um, the, in Italy, there's, some, there's political issues, but also banking challenges. There are lots of idiosyncratic issues, but there are three big ones that affect the global picture, and I want to talk about those briefly. So the first is this. We should never have expected that US growth would continue to run at 3%. That's a well above trend pace for the US economy. The unemployment rate was at a 49-year low. That wasn't going to persist, so US growth had to slow down. So why did it pick up so much? Well, a big part of why it picked up as much as it did last year was because they delivered an enormous corporate tax cut. Right? When we talk about corporate tax cuts in this country, and we haven't, we're working on legislation to potentially deliver one, when we talk about it, we talk about cutting the corporate tax rate 1% per year over a 10-year period. And economists and people ask me, they say, so what sort of effect do you think that's going to have in the economy? I say, well, you're not even going to notice it, because it's going to be pretty small. Over 10 years, it'll have an effect, but over a 10-year period, it'll just blend in. 
Well, the US cut its corporate tax rate from 35% down to 21% the first half of last year, all at once, right? So it had a pretty decent effect. It lifted equity markets, it supported some growth, but it's also temporary, right? The change is a permanent change, but it has a one-off effect on the economy. And then after that, growth slows down. So we shouldn't have expected, and indeed we don't, that, that US growth will continue to run at that 3% rate. We have it slowing to 25 this year. We think it'll slow to 1.8, which is closer to trend for the US economy um, in 2020. So US growth slowing down has an effect on the overall global story. The US economy is either the largest, depending on the measure you look at, economy, or the second largest economy in the world, so it has a big effect on those numbers. The second factor that's been slowing global growth down is that central banks, and particularly the Federal Reserve, the US central bank, has been, have been tightening settings. They've been withdrawing liquidity from the system, right? The US central bank, the Federal Reserve, lifted its policy rate four times last year. It lifted its policy rate by 100 basis points, a full percentage point. And in a world of pretty low interest rates, that's a lot. That's a big move for the Federal Reserve. They were tightening up their financial conditions. They were also, after years and years of buying assets in the market, doing what's referred to as quantitative easing, they stopped buying assets. And actually, last year, they were rolling off that balance sheet. So they were delivering what economists call quantitative tightening. So let me step back from that story. So if you think about what happened, the global financial crisis came along 10 years ago, 10 years ago, the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009. And in response to that, central banks around the world, led by the Federal Reserve, cut interest rates. The Fed cut its interest rate to zero by uh, 2000, 2010. That wasn't enough. So what they did was they started to do what's referred to as quantitative easing. They bought assets in the market, bought bonds and mortgage-backed securities. They bought three and a half trillion worth of those US government bonds and mortgage-backed securities to boost liquidity in the banking system. And so they had this big balance sheet and very low interest rates. And that was to support growth. And people had doubts that this would work. They were all very skeptical. Inflation's going to pick up. Oh, this isn't going to work in terms of driving growth. But eventually, eventually it did. And US growth gradually picked up pace. Took a while, took quite a while. But by the time we got to 14, they were able to say, well, we're not buying assets in the market anymore. And by the time we got to 2015, they said, actually, we have to start lifting our policy rate. It was at zero, and they started lifting it. And they've been gradually lifting it. And through last year, they lifted it quite a bit, as I say, another 100 basis points. So by the end of last year, in December, they had their policy rate at two and a quarter to two and a half, which is about neutral, about the level that the Federal Reserve believes where it's no longer de delivering stimulus and it's not tightening the economy. They're back. To where the, where, to back to neutral. And why did they get back to neutral? Well, because the growth was running at 3%. The economy was picking up pace. The unemployment rate was at a, nearly a 50-year low, a 49-year low. So they didn't need all that stimulus. So they've been withdrawing that stimulus from the market. And one of the things that comes along with all that stimulus is asset prices go up. When you cut interest rates and you pour that liquidity into the financial system, part of the system, the mechanism, is to drive asset prices high, equity prices, property prices. Well, if you start taking it away, those equity prices start to come down. Those markets start to correct. Part of the reason you delivered it was to drive the asset prices higher. So that was part of what happened in November and December of last year. We had this equity price sell-off. Well, that was partly because the Fed was lifting rates. The Fed wasn't the only one. The ECB also ended its quantitative easing program. I mean, you couldn't say they're tightening things because the ECB still has a policy rate at minus 40 basis points at present. It's still minus 40 basis points. But they were buying assets. They were quantitative easing, and they stopped that at the end of last year. And China had been tightening up its financial settings as well. It had been seeking to reform its financial system, allow more of its corporate debt and the non-performing loans to fall over. So there's been rising corporate debt defaults. And so that tightening has been tightening up conditions and slowing down credit growth. And that's been weighing on their growth as well. So that's the second big factor. The second big factor is that central banks have been withdrawing stimulus from, 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 from the global economy. And then the third factor has been trade policy. This is the one you hear all about. Of course, it ratcheted up through last year. We started off with tariffs on steel and aluminium introduced by the US. Then we had a big discussion between the US and Europe about the potential of putting tariffs on motor vehicles. It didn't actually flow through, but it was something that had an impact on, on sentiment. It's still in discussion, but it's, it's sort of on the back burner for the moment. They renegotiated the, Na the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, and renamed it something that's rather inconvenient to pronounce, but it's the U USMCA. But the worst deal in the world is now a deal that's bearable, even though it's sort of not that much different in the scheme of things. Um, and they did that along the way. And then the big game was that the trade tensions started to ratchet up between China and the US all through last year. But it culminated in uh, late September, on the 24th of September, where the Americans put in place a 10% tariff, tariff 
on a list of 250 billion worth of imported manufactured goods that they get from China. The Chinese reciprocated with a range of measures, including uh, restricting imports into China of, and, and taxing, uh, putting, putting tariffs on sorghum and soybeans. Why? Well, that's the Chinese second largest import from the US, so it's quite hefty. And secondly, a lot of that's produced in the Midwest, so it was expected to have some sort of political effect as well, given that's where a lot of the base is for the, for, for the Republicans and for the Trump part, uh, for, 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 tr for Donald Trump. And so there was that reciprocation. That ratcheting up of trade policy um, has started to affect manufacturing sentiment. At the time when it was introduced, that 10% tariff, actually the intention was that it would become a 25% tariff by the early part of this year. So people were fearful, or firms were fearful that actually it's going to keep ratcheting up. They called that off for the moment, and we're now in a position where we've got these trade negotiations going on between the US and China, which we're all watching very carefully. Um, but it has started to have an effect, as you might expect. Manufacturing operators who operate in a global world where they have supply chains that come from everywhere are starting to say, well, should I make an investment here or hire staff there? Maybe I should hold back a bit. I've got to work out where it is that we're going to be able to relocate some of our operations because of uh, the various policy, policy changes that are going on. And it is affecting manufacturing sentiments coming down. There's an industrial cycle that's having a downturn. It's affecting, what, uh, it's affecting the, the global industri industrial cycle. So one of the countries that's vividly affected by this is Germany. Highly open economy, very dependent on, glow, on manufacturing, very dependent on exports to China. So China's growth slowdown combined with that trade policy story is slowing down their manufacturing industry and German, Germany's growth is slowing. So Europe, Europe, is, Europe is slowing down. So those are the three things. Three things that are slowing global growth down and things we have to watch carefully. Now if you think about where we're headed into 19 and how they all fit together, well, the first thing is the tax cut's going to wear off, and that effect is something you, that's not likely to change. So U.S. growth should be expected to slow down this year anyway. The second one, the central banks, well, one of the good things, or one of the things to think about is if one of the key reasons why global growth was slowing down was because the Federal Reserve was lifting interest rates, if they stop lifting interest rates, perhaps global growth will get a bit more support. And that's precisely what we've seen markets do recently. You would have watched the equity market fall quite sharply in November and then December. Then the Federal Reserve, the US Central Bank, lifted its policy rate again in December and, did, and, and delivered what economists, what financial people call a dovish hike. What do we mean by a dovish hike? They mean they lifted interest rates and they said, well, we've lifted rates, but we don't think we're going to lift them as much as we said we might lift them again next year. Like, we, 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 we'll do less next year than we, than we thought we would. And so it was a dovish hike. Dovish as in, you know, they're, they're, they're more willing to accept more growth and, and more inflation. Uh, as it turned out, the market didn't like it very much because it wasn't a dovish enough hike. Um, apparently, the market wanted the, the Fed to actually say, no, 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 we're done. And so they came back in January and said, no, 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 yeah, we're pretty much done for now. We're not doing anything for the moment. We're going to sit still. And so the equity market bounced in January. We had the best month for the equity market, S&P 500, in January we'd had in three years because the market's market, market bounced. Now, it's an illustration of the fact that through last year, quite a big effect that was going on in terms of slowing global growth was, this, uh, was the Fed tightening. And if the Fed's on, uh, in a pause mode now, that should help to provide some support for growth into 19. The other thing that's going on, <coughs> What's important is the Chinese are starting to pull a few more of the levers. They're starting to support their own growth, particularly with their domestic levers. So they've pulled forward some infrastructure investment, subway systems in particular, from about July. They started building a few more of those. So infrastructure investment, which had been falling, has actually started to rise a bit in, in the second half of last year. They've been cutting their reserve requirement ratio, the way they pour liquidity into their banking system. They've been cutting that and pouring liquidity in. Not in a broad waste way like they've done in previous years. They're more concerned about debts rising. They're more concerned about not pump priming credit growth too rapidly. So they're doing it quite selectively for certain parts of the banking system. They're trying to contain the shadow banking system but grow uh, other parts of the banking system. So it's a bit more complex thing that they're trying to do, but they are pouring more liquidity into the system. They've allowed the renminbi to depreciate. The currency in China has come down by about 10%, I might add, which approximately offsets the impact of the tariff that's been put in place um, so far. And we think, as a house, HSBC, that uh, there's going to be a corporate tax cut also delivered in China. This uh, could be through their VAT system, their, their value-added tax system, which affects the corporate sector. So our view is that China still has quite a lot of levers to pull, and that we think that they'll pull them, and that that will support domestic growth, even in the face of slower growth in exports, which is what we're expecting, because this trade policy story is, is not quite done yet. Now, one of the big risks to 19, and one of the big uncertainties, is how these trade negotiations go and what happens. Because at the moment, 
what's, what's been reset, or the tariff that was going to be 10% that was going to rise to 25 has been pushed out to rising in March. Now, if they can renegotiate their way through it and they don't have that tariff rise, then that's, that's, that's helpful for the global economy. If they can't, then that's a risk. So the central case is that they will, that they'll find some way through, that calm heads will prevail and we don't get this continual ratchet up in, in protectionism, but it's something that's, worth, that's worth, definitely worth watching. And so those are the various things we're thinking about for, for, for this year. Global growth is slowing down. It was running at 3%. It was running at 29 last year. We think it slows to 26 and then 2.4 in the following year. It's slowing down partly because there's been some withdrawal of stimulus, partly that tax cut effect has worn off, and partly because of trade policy tensions. And that's probably the key risk that we've got to watch more carefully because we've got to work out what that actually means and how much more it ratch ratchets up. But it's, it's something that's concerning from, from, from a, global, a global perspective. So what does all this mean for Australia? How does it fit together with Australia? I always give a broad, and you probably recall this from the previous years as well, a broad global overview, because I think you can't talk about Australia in isolation. We're a medium-sized open economy, highly dependent on the rest of the world. If you don't understand what's going on there, you can't really keep track and know where the risks come from. And most of the risks, most of our story is about this global risk this year. I think that's the bigger concern in terms of watching what's going on globally. But how do we think about it for Australia? Well, the main lens through which we need to think about how Australia travels is how China travels. It's really that we are highly dependent on the Chinese growth story. 30% of our exports go to China. 65% of our exports is commodities. Iron ore, coal, base metals, liquefied natural gas, rural commodities. China dominates demand for commodities, but China also dominates supply on the supply side of commodities. They produce a lot of commodities themselves. <coughs> so what they do on supply side policy affects the prices as well. And then, of course, China dominates Asia as a region, and 73% of our exports go to Asia as a whole. So we're highly dependent on what happens in the Chinese economy. And as I said, through last year, China's growth has been slowing down, both because of the trade policy story, which has been weighing on exports, but also domestic demand has been slowing because they've been tightening up their financial conditions. They've been trying to constrain growth in debt. They've been trying to work through some of the financial challenges they've got. Their, their growth has been slowing. So how does this translate for Australia? Well, it is somewhat worrisome that China's growth is slowing down. You've got to watch it really carefully. But so far, so far, the key metric which you would look at to try and determine how much China's slowdown is affecting Australia is actually still looking OK. We're still doing OK. What is that key metric? Commodity prices. Iron ore, coal, base metals. Keep in mind, 65% of what we export is commodities. Keep in mind, China dominates that story. And if you look at Australia's commodity exports, the collection, and you weight them together and add them together based on the export weights, actually in Aussie dollar terms, it's still, it's risen to, an, to its highest level in seven years as of January. So you might say to me, how does that work, Paul? China's growth is slowing down, but commodity prices are still high. In fact, they're rising and they're at a seven year high. How come they haven't fallen as well? Fundamentally, it's to do with a particular policy in China, and this is what's deliciously counterintuitive for an economist, I might add. It's to do with environmental policy and reform policy in China. And I talked a little bit about this last year because it's been a story that's been going on since 2016, but it's been a really interesting story, and it's, it's, as I say, it's really quite counterintuitive. China demands a lot of our coal and our iron ore. Their environmental priorities have gone to the top of the, top of the list. That, that's one of the things that China is very focused on at the moment and has been since 16 in particular. And so they've been cutting back on their domestic production of low-grade coal and the product, domestic production of low-grade iron ore and instead buying high-grade coal and high-grade iron ore from Australia, which we're a big producer of the high-grade stuff. They've been cutting back on their domestic production of the low-grade stuff because, of course, that produces more pollution. So their, their environmental priority has seen them cut back on that domestic production. So coal prices rose in 16, and they've been high since then. Iron ore prices have risen, and they're high as well. And they're certainly well above the cost um, levels for the mining companies because they've all managed to get their cost down. So those, hi those higher iron ore and coal prices are actually supporting our growth story. So even though China's domestic demand has been slowing down, um, overall, actually, it's been buying more of our materials because they want the high-grade materials. And that environmental policy, we think, is quite structural. We think it's not going to disappear anytime soon. In addition to that, we think that in the second half of this year, the Chinese will deliver this corporate tax cut, and that will start to lift China's growth as well. So, so far, so good is the answer. So far, so good. We are the support we're getting from the Chinese economy is still there. Now, you might ask, how does that feed through to us? Where do we see it? Well, what we see it in, in particular, 
is corporate profitability, which has been quite strong, mining sector has been pr very profitable, and tax revenue. The budget, the federal budget at the moment, is very close to being in surplus for the first time in 10 years. We haven't had a surplus for 10 years. On a monthly, a month on month basis, you, uh, rolling, rolling the 12 month, 12 month averages, it's sitting very close to surplus. Within the next couple of months, it looks as though it'll probably tick over into that surplus territory for the first time in 10 years. I reckon we'll hear about it. What do you reckon? I think that we'll hear about it. But I, that's, that's, the budget is just about back in surplus. Why? Because the corporate tax take is up 40% in the last two years. Why is that happening? Well, a big part of it is the commodity prices have risen, the mining sector's back to being profitable, they're paying more taxes, and that's boosting the budget bottom line, right? And the budget bottom line is, 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 is supporting, is, is, is therefore giving some scope for there to be a bit more support for the economy as we run into the election, a thing we'll come to, the, to in a moment. So in terms of the global connections, so far we're doing okay. So far we're tracking okay, because those main indicators, the main things you track to watch how it flows through to Australia are holding up reasonably well. And we're, we're still reasonably positive on the China growth story. We think they've got levers to pull, and that's going to support Australia's growth running through, running through this year. So then we come to the, to the local challenges. So for Australia, we've got three, three things I'm watching as well. The first is that global story. We've already talked about it. The second one is the housing market. Okay? And that's obviously very much front and centre on everyone's minds, particularly because it's so uh, avidly covered by the press. Everyone talks about the housing market. So house prices are falling in Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, and they have been in Sydney now for 18 months. In Melbourne, they've been falling for about 12 months. And everyone knows about this. Everyone's watching this very carefully. <coughs> One of the things I find quite interesting is that two years ago, 18 months ago, the, the biggest conversation that you'd have about the housing market, the biggest concern we had about the housing market was that house prices had risen so much in these two cities, in Sydney and Melbourne, we were all asking ourselves, how on earth are our kids going to get buy a house in the same suburb they, they grew up in, or anywhere near the same suburb they grew up in? Should I be saving money in order to give, give them, allow them to have a deposit? Should I be buying them an apartment now? We were all worried about affordability. We were all worried about how affordable, how unaffordable housing was becoming in our, in our major cities. It's amazing how the story changes, because 18 months down the track, now the biggest worry is house prices are falling. And yet, the only solutions, there are only two solutions to a housing affordability problem. Only two. One, house prices can come down. Two, income growth can pick up. And that's exactly what we're getting right now. We've got house prices coming down right now in Sydney and Melbourne. They've fallen by 12% in Sydney from their peak 18 months ago, and they've fallen by 10% in Melbourne uh, from their peak a year ago, at the same time that income growth is picking up. Employment growth is strong right now. The unemployment rate in Australia, nationally, is at its lowest level in seven and a half years of 5%. Let me impress you a little bit more with a statistic. The unemployment rate in New South Wales and Victoria, in both those states, at the moment, on a trend basis, is at its lowest level in over 40 years. In over 40 years, the unemployment rate hasn't been lower in these states since the mid-1970s, right? At least the mid-1970s, because we only have monthly data going back to 1978. In the numbers, these are the lowest unemployment rates. So we are working towards improving this housing affordability problem by having a labour market that's improving at the same time that the house prices are coming down. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not concerned. Of course, house prices are coming down, and if it starts to affect confidence, it could, it could, have an effect, it could, could slow the consumer, and that could weaken the employment story along the way, and we need to keep that in mind. The first thing we need to think about, though, is why are house prices coming down? Why are they coming down? Well, to understand that, you have to first understand why they went up. They, they went up. Why, did we have a seven, why did house prices go up by 75% between the middle of 2012 and the middle of 2017 in Sydney? Why did they go up by 60% between the middle of 2012 and the end of 2017 in, in Melbourne? Well, there's a few factors, right? The first one is interest rates came down a long way, right? We had a very high cash rate, very high interest rates back in 2011, 2012, we were absorbing an enormous mining boom. We had an enormous mining boom in Australia. We needed high interest rates to slow down all the other sectors of the economy to make way for this mining boom to happen. And then when the mining boom came to its end, we needed to slash interest rates to get the currency lower and get the interest rates lower to rebalance growth so that everything else could pick up and offset that decline in mining investment. We saw a pick up in education exports, tourism exports, a pick up in the manufacturing industry, and we saw a pick up in housing demand. Makes sense, interest rates came down, so we saw this strong pickup in housing demand. We'd had strong population growth, which continued, so that created demand for housing as well, and interest rates came down. So house prices started rising in Sydney and Melbourne because the other, those are the two cities that really aren't exposed to the end of the mining boom. So Sydney, Sydney and Melbourne house prices started to rise. So demand was strong. Demand was also strong because foreign demand was strong. Global interest rates were phenomenally low 
and people were searching for yield for assets. So they were pouring money into housing markets around the world, and we had a lot of China money flowing in from China. Right? So that supported demand for housing. On the supply side, we'd spent many, many, many years building lots of mines, and we hadn't built enough houses in New South Wales and Victoria. We had strong population growth, so we had an undersupply. We didn't have enough to meet that demand. So strong demand, weak supply, house prices go up. That's the story, right? Why did it come to its end? Why did house prices start falling in 2017? What, what brought that to its end? Those forces all started to reverse, right? Interest rates stopped falling. Global interest rates stopped falling in about 16 and started to gradually rise, but essentially they stopped falling. Um, foreign demand pulled back. Chinese capital controls were put in place in 2016 to restrict capital coming out of China. We constrained foreign buyers from borrowing from the domestic banking system. You needed to demonstrate a domestic income in order to get a loan onshore, so you couldn't get money onshore either. And so that constrained the, for the foreign bid. At the same time, we had a a exuberance in the housing market. Investors started to get involved because house prices were rising for these fundamental reasons, but it, it kind of got ahead of itself. So the authorities, the prudential regulators, started tightening the prudential settings gradually. And they, they tried to slow it down by testing new borrowers for higher mortgage rates, and then they moved on to slowing down in lending to investors, and then they moved on to interest-only loans, and eventually it slowed down that credit story. And, then we had a Royal Commission, which had some impact on lending conditions as well, and we'll see exactly how much, but it is having a bit of an effect, and that slowed down the flow of finance and slowed down the demand side. And then we built a whole lot of apartments, which we've been doing, and filling that gap to catch up with demand, and all of that combined to start to see housing market, the housing market cool. What's very unusual, historically unusual, unprecedented, we have never seen before in Australia, house prices come down in our major cities at the same time that the employment story is picking up, the unemployment rate is falling. So it's very hard to know exactly how this is going to translate, and people talk a lot about a negative wealth effect. House prices are coming down, people are going to consume less. Actually, we've seen very little evidence during that house price boom, when house prices went up by, in Sydney by 75%, Melbourne by 60%, that there was any positive wealth effect, that people were going out and spending money because their house prices were rising. It seemed, in the numbers at least, that people were more concerned that house prices were rising and that they would have to save money to buy their kids' houses. It seemed that there wasn't, there wasn't any evidence, for example, of equity withdrawal, like we saw a, 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 in the early 2000s, where people were withdrawing money to spend it on other things because their house prices were rising. So very little evidence of a, neg of a positive wealth effect. It's still not clear whether we're going to get much of a negative wealth effect. We might, and we, we're seeing some round the edges of retail sales slowing down a bit, and motor vehicle sales slowing a bit. But it's, it's still not clear that it's going to deliver some sort of large negative effect. And the main thing, the core thing here, is that the labour market continues to hold up, that, that employment growth continues, and that the unemployment rate still stays low, which ties my two stories together. Part of that story relies on the global economy holding up. Part of it relies on China holding up and doing reasonably well, and those commodity prices staying at elevated levels. So those are the thing, two big things we're watching. Those are two of the big things we're watching. The third big thing is this, politics and infrastructure investment. I'd combine those two things together at the moment. Um, because when I think about what's going on from a fiscal side, from the government spending side, a fundamental thing at the moment that is supporting growth is a very large pipeline of infrastructure investment that's going on in this country. Um, interest rates have been low for a persistent period of time, and it took a long time for governments to realize that actually when interest rates are low, what, it would be useful to borrow more money and build infrastructure that would be useful for the future. And it took a while, but we got there, and we're now, we've now got this very strong pipeline of infrastructure investment going on. One of the statistics I like the most at the moment is if you look at the collection of state and federal budgets from last year, from November, when you can collect them all together, and you compare them to the previous year, the pipeline of infrastructure investment got bigger between those two years by, a full, by $10 billion a year for 2019-20 and 2020-21. $10 billion each year. That's half a percent of GDP additional to the pipeline, not, not, was, not in the pipeline in total, but in addition to what was already there, a boost to growth of another half a percent of GDP in those two years. Now, to give you some context, half a percent of GDP, that's the maximum effect that the apartment building boom has had on this country two years ago. When the building boom was ramping up and contributing its most to GDP, it was half a percent of GDP we were getting from it. So in the last year, we've added another chunk to the infrastructure pipeline that's that large again. And so, if I think about that, I think that's going to be one of the key supports for growth uh, as, we, as, as we move, for, move through this year as well. In addition to that, as we run into the election, uh, I suspect we're going to see some more spending announcements. I think we're going to get some tax cuts. I think given the budget is almost back in surplus and it looks as though 
you know, it's not going to be a, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be a challenging election, let's say. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more announcements of spending yet. Um, and probably a lot of the more of those announcements are going to happen before the 23rd of March. Why? Well, because we're having a state election here in New South Wales on the 23rd of March that precedes the federal election that's happening in May. And they kind of have to win one to think they're going to win the next. I think that's kind of how you do your arithmetic if you were sitting there working out the policy strategy. So I think we're going to see quite a bit more announcements of spending. So I think that's going to support growth too. So where do I wrap up? How do I, how do I think we're traveling? The global economy is slowing down, and it does present some more challenges for Australia. I'm, I'm not going to deny that. And if it's slowed down even more than we're expecting, then, then ratchet's lower. And if China isn't able to manage its way through that, that's one of the risks we have to watch too. But so far, we are doing OK in terms of our ties to China, partly because those commodity prices are holding up. And we think they'll hold up reasonably well, because China's got levers to pull. And that supply side policy, the environmental policy, we think is going to stay in place. It's fairly structural. Locally, so that should support the growth story locally. The housing market's cooling, but so far it's happening in a very orderly fashion. We haven't seen signs of distressed sales or a pickup in loan arrears, and a lot of that is because the labour market's still holding up. We've got the unemployment rate at a seven and a half year low at present. We think our central case, for what it's worth, given that global backdrop, is that the unemployment rate will edge further lower this year as well. That's starting to put a little bit of upward pressure on wages growth. I said earlier, wages growth has not picked up quite as quickly as we were expecting. It hasn't, but it has been rising. So it was running at 1.9% two years ago. It's now running at 2.3 on the key indicator. You might say that's glacial. It is glacial, but it is also a clear sign that there is a little bit of upward momentum in the wages growth story. Why? The unemployment rates at a seven and a half year low. If you want skilled workers, you have to pay them a bit more. That's usually how it works. And that's kind of what we're seeing going on. So we think that wages growth will gradually climb through this year, supporting incomes. And we think that if that continues, that will allow us to have this housing market correction that's going on in Sydney and Melbourne without it necessarily flowing through to a broader slowdown in the overall economy. And then the other part of this story is the fiscal coffers have been recharged. Right? We're back at almost a surplus. And as we run into the election, I think we're going to see more of that spent. Part of it's already being spent on infrastructure investment, but we expect probably a bit more to come this way as well. So although I started off, and I, I still think that this year is more challenging, when I come, if, if I come back next year, and I'm talking, and I'm, I, I you know, want, it, want it to be on the record, that you know, it is a more challenging year. And we are watching this global story very carefully. And if things slow down more globally in China, it's going to be a bit more challenging. And I think it, you know, it could weigh on our growth story. We actually still have a reasonably positive outlook for growth here for those various reasons. We still have growth holding up at about 3% this year, which is about a little bit above trend for Australia. We still think the unemployment rate's got further to fall. There's a few things, few more things that could go wrong in that story um, than we've seen in, perhaps in the past couple of years, as I say, because when you've got a strong global economy that's got momentum, it's actually quite helpful. When it slows down, it, gets, it makes it tougher for Australia. So those are the broad parameters of our story. We think the RBA is on hold this year. We don't think they're doing anything. Um, we, like their suggestions in their forecast, think that their next move is more likely to be up than down. But we're you know, acknowledging that the global risks could play out, and maybe their next move is down. But our, our view is that they're on hold this year. Um, and in terms of the Aussie dollar, which everyone always asks me about at the end, it's almost impossible to forecast the Aussie dollar. But we have to have one. That's what we're paid to do. So. I've got a guy who works for me, he does it, and then I can take the credit if he's right and blame him if he's wrong. Um, it's, we think it'll fall a bit further from here. We have in mind a stronger US dollar story, the Aussie dollar heading towards sort of 66 cents is our, is our target for later on this year. We'll see, we'll see. Forecasting the Aussie dollar is a tough gig. So I'm going to stop there. I've got about five or 10 minutes to take questions. Well, a big round of applause. Wonderful stuff, Paul Bloxham. Woohoo, OK. We have a couple of handheld microphones moving around the room. Don't be shy. Please put your hand in the air. Get the attention of the two women with the microphones if you'd like to ask a question. Let me get you started, Paul. Of all the factors you've listed today, how big a variable is the federal election in all of those? How, how, how big a tilt could that put in either direction? Well, I think when we have federal elections, it creates more uncertainty, obviously. And there are a couple of key policy um, policy planks that the opposition is proposing that are getting a lot of attention right now. So, so one of them is changing the rules around negative gearing. The other is changing the rules around franking credits. Um, and so that's, those are two things that people, there's a lot of discussion about right now. Um, and I think, so they're important. I, I have a, a sort of, I've got a couple of views on those. I mean, I think the negative gearing changes actually in the end are going to be actually quite small in terms of their overall impact. 
because they're proposing to grandfather the whole system. They're proposing to still allow the existing arrangements to apply to new dwellings. It's going to be removed from existing dwellings. Um, investors have already pulled back from the market, of course. The housing market's cooling, house prices are coming down, so there's a far, few, far fewer involved. And the other thing is, investors you know, are somewhat rational. They're already seeing that the tax policy could be changed, and therefore it's probably having an impact to a degree already in terms of investment decisions. So I suspect if it is changed, if that's what happens, if we get a change, all the ifs, um, then I, I actually think that it's not going to have that bigger effect on the overall story. I think in principle also, I mean, we have a tax system that does overly encourage people to invest in housing rather than investing in other productive assets. It's not clear to me that this is necessarily a, an efficient tax system and, and a, a reform in that direction is probably not a, not, not a I, I, and our view is that it actually could be, could be, would be something quite helpful for a better allocation of capital across the economy. Not as keen necessarily on the franking credit change. I think that you've got to get down to the, to the bottom of it. What did we do it for in the first place? It was to encourage firms to use equity rather than debt funding. That's what it does. It allows the removal of double taxation. So you know, encouraging the, the corporate sector to take on more debt here now by changing the system, I think, is not necessarily the best way to go about things. We're a small open economy dependent on the rest of the world and commodity prices, which are very volatile, a less leveraged corporate sector is probably a helpful thing. So those are a couple of views on those things. The, the broad principle for me is, as I've kind of relayed in, 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 the, in the presentation, is I think with the budget where it is, what the election is actually going to mean in the end is more spending. We're going, to see, we're going to see more announcements for more tax cuts, more spending as we run towards the election. I think that will actually be a support for growth, despite the uncertainties of those various possible policy changes that might might happen if we get a change of government. Let's take a couple of audience questions. We've got any questions there? No? No? OK, I've got another one for you. US-China tra uh, US trade war, and that seems to be a, a, t a tough call as to where that goes because one of the actors in particular is a little bit hard to predict sometimes. Which one? Uh, how, 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 well, one of, one of them is more openly hard to predict. How, how, how big do you think it's going to play out? But part two of the question, if they did, if the US and China went flat out at each other, who would win? <laughs> no one. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's the true answer. It, it, you know, um, it is very hard to predict how it's going to play out. It really is. Um, I think if I look at the way the market's pricing at the moment, the market sort of is, is pricing the idea that they are going to find some sort of agreement. We don't see a 25% tariff. I think in most of my discussions when I sort of travel the world and talk to corporates and, and clients, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a sense that a 10% tariff is absorbable. You know, the currency moved by about 10%. You can absorb 10% into margins if you need to. But a 25% tariff might be just that, a, a step too far, that there's a sort of non-linearity in the whole thing. There's a, there's a threshold effect you might, you might hit, it, that sort of thing. And I think there's also a sense in which now that the 10% tariff's been delivered and, and there, is, there are signs that the manufacturing industry is having a downturn and global trade is slowing and it seems to be related to these trade policy tensions that hopefully negotiators and decision makers at high, in high places will notice that actually it can be um, quite disruptive and that that doesn't necessarily favour uh, continued growth. So, uh, you know, that's, that I think is what, the way the market's positioning this story. I mean, you know, the more it ratchets up, I think the, the worse it is for the overall global growth story. And I think both, um, you know, it's, it's not good for really for anyone in the, in the global system, I think, for, for us to head towards a world where there's more tensions between the two uh, world's two largest economies. Any audience questions? Gentleman over there, get the microphone. Th thank you, uh, Charles Northcote. Thank you for your presentation this morning. The interesting thing that seems to have slipped off the political radar is immigration and its impact on particularly housing and the uh, flow of that into the Australian economy. What comments do you have on the immigration impact? Uh, it's been a fundamental driver of Australia's growth over a long run of years. I would say uh, the fact that we've got strong population growth relative to other countries, and, and it's running at about 1.6% at the moment year on year, if you're interested in the numbers. Um, and about a little over half of that is, in, is, is immigration is, a, is one of the fundamental reasons why Australia is currently in its 28th year of continuous GDP growth. 
which is a feat unmatched by any other developed world economy in the available statistics. I think I've said that before at this, at this event. Um, you know, we've had the longest period of expansion in our own history, but the longest period of expansion of any developed world economy, because our economy's kept growing and a, and a fundamental underpinning support for that has been a healthy flow of immigration. It does other things too. If you look at the demographic story, in general, you get a slightly younger group of people moving to the country than, than the existing population. So it helps to deal with some of those demographic challenges that other countries are facing particularly in Europe, for example, or Japan, where the population's already shrinking. Um, immigration actually helps to give you a, a younger population, which you need to have a workforce in order to fund the older population. So it helps to deal with that, that demographic issue. Um, in terms of where we're at, in terms of policy, I, I don't think either of the major parties, I think they're both in the centre enough on this issue. There are always fringe elements that want to really slow it down. Um, and, uh, you know, but I don't, I don't think it's actually the core policy of either at this stage um, to necessarily have a significant slowdown in immigration, which, as I say, and I'm describing, is a key reason why Australia, I think, has had this, this economic success, where we, 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 we need to build the infrastructure and the housing and, uh, and the social infrastructure to support the population growth that, um, that we've had and, in fact, that we're, we're going to have. That needs to happen. I, I understand that. Uh, but that's not a reason not to have the immigration. It's a reason to focus on building the appropriate infrastructure, which is, which is what, I, as I say, I think there's progress in the right direction in that regard. There's probably a lot more that can be built as yet still. No pressure. Final audience question. Take it away, sir. Um, last year's surf was up. This year's be wary of the surf what you use, potentially. <laughs> um, last year we talked about having a fair bit of consideration around tourism. Um, students coming into the town and also traditional tourism and also student services to support um, that in education, exporting, et cetera, et cetera. You see much change in that with that volatility as a market backdrop? No, so, and, and you're right, and thank you for that question because it's great, I didn't really talk about that much this, this, this time around and it is still a key underpinning for our growth story. I think I would have spent quite a bit of time talking about it last year that you know, uh, international education exports is Australia's third largest export mm. behind iron ore and uh, between coal, behind coal now, which has overtaken iron ore and, and, and iron, uh, so coal and iron ore is international student services. It's a $34 billion a year industry. It's growing at 20% per annum over the last five years. We've doubled the international students onshore in the last five years. It's driven by Asia, students coming from China and coming from India. And I think it's, it's a fundamental core underpinning of our growth story. It's, it's tied partly to the immigration story, of course. Students come here, they study, often they become, part of, they, they, they become part of the population eventually as well. But even while they're here, they demand services like housing and goods and, 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 serve, uh, sorry, and, and, and other services. And so that's been one of the supports for our growth story. If you look at the numbers and you look at services exports as a share of the contribution to GDP, it's been contributing pretty consistently about half a percent a year to, to, the, to the overall GDP story. So, you know, when, you know it's, it's, it's actually another one where you could say the, internet, the, the, student, the services export story is equivalent, uh, uh, contributing the same amount as the dwelling investment boom did at its peak. So we, we spent a lot of time, and I kind of, I guess this is a point that I, I, I was sort of drawing out, spent a lot of time obsessing about the housing market, watching the housing market. It makes sense, it's the biggest asset for most people, and it's, it's it, you know, we all watch what's going on with house prices. But I think it also tends to mean that we think that the housing market is the whole economy, and that, I think that's, that's, and that's not right. It's certainly not right. The housing, you know, housing construction is about 5% of GDP, um, you know, the vast majority of the economy is a whole bunch of other things, services in particular. And so we need to not have that view. We need, you know, we need to take, put it in the context of the labour market is probably much more important overall than the housing market. The two can be related, but actually, the, you know, it's certainly not that the housing market is telling you exactly what's going on in the overall economy right now. Actually, the labour market is telling you the unemployment rate's at a seven and a half year low. Thanks for the question, though. I, I didn't talk about as, mu as much about services this year, but it's still a positive contributor to the growth story. In wrapping it up, I'm, I'm certain you'll be back next year. So in the plethora of numbers and facts that you've thrown at us this year, and some of them are very hard to predict and all that sort of stuff, what's your one banker? What's the one thing you've said today that you're willing to put an absolute hard, fast number? What's the thing you're most likely to come back next year and go, I absolutely nailed that one? <laughs> Well, I can tell you, I, I, I can really only tell you what's happening in history with certainty. I, no, honestly, I mean, this is the thing, right? With, this is, and this is a really good point to make, which is everything, this whole game about forecasting is, is tough. There are big error bands around everything we do. So you wouldn't say there's anything, any number you'd predict with certainty out into the future and from an economic perspective. Aside from the fact that by next year, I will be one year older, guaranteed. There you go. And we'll love to see him again. Then give Paul a big round of applause. Great stuff, Paul Bloxham. 
HSBC. Okay. What a great way to start the day. Good to see some people kicking back in the King Living Lounge area back there. Let's meet now our next guest speaker, Telstra's superstar recruit in late 2018. Our next speaker, as Group Executive Telstra Enterprise, is responsible for revenues in excess of $8 billion, or as fans of the Austin Powers movies, as Dr. Evil would say, $8 <laughs> billion. He's responsible for Telstra's international operations as well, with approximately 3,500 people in 20 countries and the largest subsea cable network in the Asia-Pacific region. He joined Telstra from SBS, where he'd been CEO and managing director since 2011. In 2017, he was awarded a member of the Order of Australia for his services to both broadcast media and multicultural affairs. He was named CEO of the Year at CEO Magazine's Executive of the Year Awards. Here, a big round of applause, please, for Michael Abid. Good morning. Thank you very much, Adam, for that introduction. Let me just get set up. Um, thank you for, for having me this morning. Um, it's wonderful to be here to talk about a topic that I'm very passionate about, which is digital transformations and making sure you get them really successful. Since I started in my role at Telstra about four months ago, um, it's an international role, so I've been spending a lot of time with our clients both here domestically and internationally. And the one thing that a lot of companies, nearly every company is talking about, is transformations in their organisations. And, um, and a lot of companies are starting to realise that a good, successful digital transformation will be the difference between their success or failure, particularly as they realise more and more that they've got to disrupt themselves before either competitors or people outside their industry are going to disrupt their industry. So I thought today I'd talk about digital transformations, what it is, what, what drives it, and why it matters, and give you some insights into some global research that Telstra Enterprise has just completed that we haven't actually released to the market yet, that takes a look at the kind of decisions that companies are making when it comes to digital transformations. So a couple of weeks ago, I was um, fortunate enough to spend a bit of time at CES, the, the Consumer Electronics Show, which is the, the largest electronics show in the world. There's about 240,000 delegates. It was a bit insane. Besides all the hot gadgets and cool and high-tech experiences, everything from flying taxis, literally imagine a giant drone that seats 10, um, you know, these flying taxis, to TV screens that roll up into the width of a, a shoebox, um, to toy robots that will fold your laundry, literally, in that bottom left corner. Um, but it provided a fascinating insight into the technology themes. They're going to influence the way we work, the way we interact with each other, and generally how we live our lives. But the major themes that emerged this year were based on disruptive technologies that many of us might be familiar with, themes around artificial intelligence, and the fact that AI is going to be everywhere. Almost every connected device on the planet is soon going to have artificial intelligence infused into it. As the internet of things has grown exponentially, AI is now going to be applied um, to interpret the vast amounts of data that's been collected from all these devices. And the Internet of Things is fast becoming the intelligence of things. 5G was also a key factor at Vegas, as indeed it is for Telstra. And put simply, 5G is going to be an absolute game changer for just about every single industry. When connectivity um, is, is very much becoming today's currency, the impact on f of 5G is going to be exponential from when we moved from 3G to 4G. It's going to affect everything from wearable devices and sensors to smart buildings and cities and radically change industries like logistics and aviation and mining and broadcasting. And we're going to be able to access far more content than ever before, um, instantaneous data and activities and entertainment. Uh, something that will really start becoming a reality from the middle to end of this year. And CES, for me, absolutely confirmed that Telstra and Australia is absolutely the forefront of 5G globally. Autom autonomous vehicles is the other big theme at CES. And despite the fact that it's been talked about for some time now, it's been quite a hot topic, all the major car manufacturers were there exhibiting their latest innovations. 
And autonomous, autonomous vehicles are going to open the door, I think, to dozens of potential use cases, ranging from mass transportation, supply chain management, and 5G with its low latency and high speeds and capacity uh, will also then, and, and if you add edge computing to that, will be the catalyst for the broader and finally safer deployment of autonomous vehicles. But for me, it kind of feels a little bit like we're on the cusp of, of major change that we've never seen before. But at the same time, I kind of have a bit of deja vu about it as well. And it takes me back to when I was in my 20s and I joined IBM as a young graduate. And uh, this will age me a little bit, but we launched the very, very first PC. I think it was called the IBM JX or something like that. And at the time, there was a lot of people internally debating when we launched the PC whether anybody would ever want a PC in their home. It was an absolute you know, topic of debate. Um, and people couldn't see that the PC could be anything other than a business tool. Fast forward 10 years when I joined Optus in its early days and we were launching 2G, this thing called SMS came along and everyone was debating whether anyone would actually spend 25 cents to send a text message. Why would you send a text message when you could actually phone somebody? Um, and of course, today we send over a billion text messages every single day around the planet. Fast forward another 10 years, and I was fortunate to be at the ABC doing some major digital transformations there when we launched iView. Again, sim similar things, people debating whether anybody would watch content, let alone long form content, on a small screen or a PC keeping in mind the, the iPad hadn't even been invented then. And now, of course, we've got 5G just around the corner. And I believe that in time, it is going to be a bigger game changer than all those things put together. The 5G technology um, will absolutely turn up the dial on innovation and supercharge the fourth industrial revolution. And 5G is going to be underpinned by emerging and disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence, augmented reality, automation, the IoT, the Internet of Things, and robotics, and many others. And it's all these things put together at the same time as 5G that's going to make it really powerful and change and be powerful for use cases. This fourth industrial revolution will drive an even greater degree of disruption to many businesses that we're already seeing across the globe today. Things are not going to slow down. In fact, I think they're going to accelerate and big disruptors like Uber, Airbnb, and Netflix are absolutely just the tip of the iceberg in terms of how change is coming at us and coming at us really fast. So what, do, what is it about these technologies uh, that is driving such dramatic change in our industries and the way we do business? I think digital technologies have dramatically altered the balance of power between the organisations and our customers. Gaining powerful information and choice and convenience is the key differentiator. And I think digitally mature companies with digital technologies at their core have many advantages over their analog counterparts with legacy systems. They deliver better customer experiences, they anticipate their customers' needs, and they try and exceed them. And they use data and data analytics to evolve their products and services to better meet the customer adapting to change in market conditions and, of course, the, the customer demands. And they also operate at dramatically less uh, cost, better economics than a lot of their counterparts as well, um, using automation and robotics. And I think Amazon is a fantastic example of this. And to date, Jeff Bezos, with his philosophy of agility um, and highly adaptive e-commerce platform, they've managed to disrupt not only one but several industries of retail, parcel delivery, books, cloud computing, and of course, there's many more to come. So with the rules of business being rewritten nearly every day, we've got to change the way we do things to deliver outcomes that our customers desire to generate for, uh, new revenue streams from digital products and services and create different business models for ourselves with technology at its core. And I think as a result, digital transformation has become a critical priority for just about every organisation around the world. You don't have to look very far than Telstra 
to see a great example of a company where all these scenarios are playing out. Telstra's T22 strategy announced by our CEO Andy Penn uh, in the middle of last year really works hard to, to counter this immense disruption that we're facing in the telco sector. Telecommunication companies in Australia and around the world are impacted by unprecedented change, driven by this digital disruption, massive growth in demand for data, mainly driven by video and increasing competition uh, and rising customer expectations and changing customer expectations. Added to this, Telstra's got a, um, an additional challenge, the MBN. And the National Broadband Network effectively renationalises Australia's fixed broadband network. And it means that Telstra is no longer the wholesale provider of connectivity and the internet for retail service providers. And the impact of Telstra is absolutely, sorry, the impact of NBN on Telstra is absolutely profound. It, ha sorry, it, it takes away about one third of the organisation's EBITDA and about half of our NPAT. And our NPAT figure, of course, is what pays the dividend for our large retail shareholder base. So imagine something that came along that took away half of your NPAT. You don't have a choice. You've got to transform your organisation. And that's what T22 is all about. It's about radically simplifying our products and eliminating our customer pain points, creating a digital or an all digital experience, ensuring that we've got a sustainable cost base for the future. We already have the largest and most reliable network in the country, but we also want to become the country's most easiest to interact with and offer great services that are easy to understand and that they're flexible with no gotcha clauses, which the telco sector has been notorious at around the world for years. And if we can get rid of those gotchas and make things simple, I think we'll rebuild trust and confidence for our consumer, small business and enterprise customers. To do this, we're going to do things like we're going to reduce the number of consumer and small business plans from 1,800 plans today to just 20 simple core plans, where when you sign up to them, you don't pay a single cent more than you signed up for. And we've also established, as you can see there in the, in the second or the third box, um, a standalone infrastructure business that's going to drive better performance for our organisation and to give us options post the NBN rollout. And we're also simplifying our internal structures and the way we work, adopting new ways of working to empower our people to be able to serve customers better at the front line. And in the division that I run, the enterprise business, our customers, we're also wanting to make sure that we continue to be one of the best one-stop shop for all business-to-business -business technology needs, offering modular, curated, self-service and much simplified product set, again, halving the number of products that we have in the enterprise space. And my vision for the enterprise business is to be far more than the trusted provider that we are today, through partnering and supporting our clients with our professional and managed services, through, you know, helping them with cloud and, and in particular the growing concerns around cyber security and programmable networks to give all of you flexibility with your own systems. That enables you to be able to focus on your own business and thrive with your customers and grow your own customer satisfaction scores. Increasingly, we're growing our international business as well as we support our domestic and international customers as they grow in our region and beyond. But what I want to focus on now today is the challenge of getting these digital transformations right. And it's a lot more than just um, digitising a process or implementing a new technology or hiring um, some sort of digital expertise. With so many options available, the pace of change is absolutely unrelenting and increasing in complexity. With every new innovation, in reality, it's challenging and we've got to get it right to make the, inf the, the decisions to get these programs correct. Believe me, I know it's hard, and I know um, the reality is that there is no one formula for success. And as the CEO of SBS for the last seven and a half years, I, I led the transformation of just about every part of the business, from the back of house to the front of house, 
from the, ma the way we made content to the way we stored it to the way we broadcasted it. And you do have to think about your entire ecosystem, its interoperab interoperability, and how your employees, partners, suppliers, and of course your customers are going to interact with it. You can't look at it in a piecemeal fashion. So as digital transformations become critical to businesses, so do the decisions that we have to make. So I mentioned earlier the research that Telstra Enterprises recently commissioned titled Disruptive Decision Making takes a fresh look at the challenges that leaders and businesses face as we go through and make the right decisions and how to approach digital transformations to deliver the outcomes that we obviously want to grow our businesses. To shed a light on these challenges um, and a lot more, we surveyed over um, 3,800 people from about 11 different industries and sectors from 14 different markets around the world. And we spoke to a lot of people leading digital transformation projects within organisations, primarily the heads of business units and, and um, um, chair people, uh, CEOs, uh, CIOs, etc., that are leading these transformations. And we looked at decision making as it relates to four key factors around people, process, technology, and partners, and uncovered some really valuable insights into where organisations believe their decision making strengths and weaknesses were. We also gained a really good understanding on how decision making influences business outcomes and where organisations can focus their attention to improve their initiatives to highlight their own goals. So let's start by looking at how we're progressing as a nation around digital transformation. And what we found is that there's a huge opportunity for Australian businesses. While there was certainly strong recognition amongst the respondents of the importance of digital transformation, as many as 37% of Australian organisations said that they had barely started their digital transformation journey. That's much higher than the global average. And only 15% said they were digitally mature, again, much lower than the global average. In other words, Australians are trailing the field of digital transformations globally. And I think the key to this is that our organisations lack a strength in decision making and while 23% of global organisations feel that dis, um, digital transformation decisions, they do that really well, only 18% of Australian organisations rated themselves highly. Likewise, the approach to digital transformation is not usually an integrated whole of company approach. Nearly 70% of Australian companies said that e they either outsourced their digital transformation or they did it on an incremental basis, driven often by a company's business unit. In other words, your interoperability and your entire ecosystem is not looked at holistically. The risk, of course, with incrementalism is that you still carry legacy systems and processes forward, diminishing the value of the new with the old and often never retiring legacy systems. And when asked how well you integrate across the business for digital transformation projects, only 17% of organisations felt that their transformation efforts were extremely well integrated, while a staggering 33% of us felt that they were not done well at all. The good news, of course, is that for all our organisations in Australia, we're being realistic about where we are and where we are on the journey of that. So then when we ask people to rate the top digital transformation priorities in Australian organisations, the one thing that stood out was protecting their digital assets from cyber threats. That was number one, very closely followed by optimising technology to move faster and adapt to change came very close second. And thirdly, delivering, delivering great consistent customer experiences um, across their global operations was third. However, when asked about performance in these areas, in these priorities, they recorded some of the lowest scores out of all the priorities. So therefore, protecting digital assets from cyber threats actually came out the second lowest in performance, even though companies said it was the one thing they valued and wanted to fix the most. 
It indicates that companies recognise the importance of cybersecurity, but they don't have a good understanding of how to manage it. Most companies, like Telstra, res literally receive hundreds of cybersecurity threats each and every day. Hundreds of threats each and every day. And we've really developed and strengthened our expertise because we know that this is a growing area of concern for our customers. Globally, there's also a similar pattern. Protecting digital assets from cybersecurity threats was again a number one priority globally, yet in terms of performance on that priority, it came dead last in our survey. To determine decision-making ability, we also asked respondents to rate their organization's effectiveness across seven stages of decision-making in digital transformation. And while Australian, Australian respondents had a positive uh, perception of their organization's decision-making ability, the lowest net scores were around the foundational stages of digital transformation, and I believe, arguably, they are the most important. That is, having the right vision and mindset and an understanding and establishing what your digital transformation project means for your business. And these were rated at the lowest stages out of all the stages that we asked in the survey. I think it's clear that organisations can do a lot more at the very outset of their digital transformation projects across all areas of the business. Why are you doing that digital transformation? Understanding the reason for the transformation and communicating that clearly with its objectives is a critical step to your employees um, and your partners if you're going to have a successful journey and to help the transformation teams in your organisations as well have a clear understanding of why and where you're heading to determine its success. Universally, across all four factors of priorities, respondents rated their digital transformation performances much lower than their decision-making ability. In particular, our results found that organisations in Australia find it really hard to tie digital transformations projects back to hard financial measures such as increased profit margins or increased revenue growth. I think this is a real issue when you consider that business imperatives for these projects and the investments that we're making in them um, is exactly what we're seeking to, to achieve at the outset. So currently, organisations in Australia are realising benefits um, of good digital transformation and decision making through softer business measures such as increased um, customer experiences or delivering better business efficiencies. I think one of the reasons for these results may be of where we put our focus on decision making. When rating their ability across all four factors to contribute to successful decision making, people, processes, technology and partnerships, Australian respondents cited their technology understanding as the absolute strongest capability. Yet concentrating on technology alone does not guarantee success in any way. One of our most interesting findings is that digitally mature organisations overwhelmingly show strength across all four decision-making factors, almost equally. Our research also found that organisations that focus on multiple elements of decision-making are significantly more likely to be digitally mature and make good decisions throughout the process and integrate extremely well. By comparison, companies focusing on technology alone were much, uh, showed much less progress in digital maturity, decision making and integration. So the fourth one around partnerships is where we found Australian organisations struggle the most. It achieved the lowest net score out of all four segments. Partnerships also finished last when it came to both agility and performance. And this suggests that Australian organisations aren't set up to realise the value that they could from their digital transformation partners. Our focus on technology um, continues when it's looking at attributes that organisations in Australia seek from digital partners. So we, we, when we're looking for partners, we're just looking at their technology know-how. I think this indicates to me that companies are not considering 
the role of partners outside of the technology sphere and that they should be looking at those who you can partner with that can help you across the whole process of people elements and the digital trans transformation journey as well. And I firmly believe that it's essential to get the balance right between people, process, technology and partnerships. By its very nature, technology obviously is at the heart of every business transformation, but it cannot be the dominant factor and it needs to be wrapped up with people, process and partners. And if I draw on my own experience during my time as CEO of SBS, back in 2011, like most broadcasters, SBS was faced with an impending threat of services like Netflix that were changing viewer habits dramatically. And we'd never seen change like it in the broadcasting sector. Doing nothing, of course, was not an option. We had to come up with plans to address, address this disruption. And when we developed and launched SBS On Demand, which was essentially a digital platform where viewers can connect with the content that appealed to them at a time and a place and a device that suited them, it absolutely transformed the viewing experience, but it also had to be integrated in all our back-end systems. Interestingly, there was little available um, funding to be able to do this, so we relied heavily on partners and made sure that we had open source architecture and we relied on our commercial revenues to fund it. Fast forward to 2019, and SBS On Demand has now got over six million registered users. That's one in three Australian adults. And recently, Roy Morgan published a report that said SBS On Demand had more registered users than seven, nine, and 10, which is pretty amazing when you consider the size of SBS on, on its market share on t TV. So it's far more than just a catch-up service. It's got over 6,000 hours of content um, that is often not broadcast on TV. And fascinatingly, a lot of TV shows will get far more audiences on SBS On Demand than on TV. So it's completely changed the landscape. And what's even more amazing is when you think about the fact that 75% of the content is in languages other than English, it's really about customers accessing diversified content when they choose. But when I look back on the broader digital transformation that we had through the newsrooms, when we digitally transformed the newsrooms at SBS, the radio networks, the IT, the broadcast playout facilities where we moved to an all cloud-based solution, technology processes, and technology processes and partnerships all played an absolute pivotal role in the decision making and the ultimate success of that journey. But in my view, it was getting the organisation's culture right absolutely at the very front that played a critical role in bringing all these parts together to make the right decisions. Having a clear vision and people all knowing why we had to change and what success looked like was really important. And empowering our employees to make decisions a lot faster all improved employee engagement and the organisation's culture overall. Throughout all of this research that Telstra has conducted and from my own experience, I think if I was to highlight one constant, it would be the important role of the CEO involvement. From our research, we know that companies that integrate digital transformations across their whole business appropriately weighting the foundational stages that I talked about, about getting the clear vision right, um, through to balancing people, culture, process, and technology, um, and their partners uh, were far more digitally mature and ultimately successful. These responsibilities are increasingly a major part of the CEO's remit. The benefits of a successful CEO-led approach to digital transformation cannot be underestimated. And the impact is not only digital, but it manifests itself tangibly in our bottom lines. We know that because highly digitally mature organisations in Australia are far more likely to achieve increased profit margins than organisations that haven't started their digital transformation journey. And of course, the same is true for every business objective that we surveyed. That includes revenue growth and improved customer experiences, where digitally mature companies were 12 points more likely to be successful um, uh, with their priorities, with both those priorities of revenue and customers. 
These companies are clear on what digital transformation means for them and for their organisation. They've empowered their people and they've strengthened their processes and identified the key partners who can help them far more than just the technology part. And they're likewise confident in their technology enabling them to concentrate on driving their business. So for business leaders, making the right digital decisions provides enormous rewards, but it's certainly no easy task. So in closing, while there's no silver bullet for, for digital success, there is certainly, uh, there is certainty, I should say, that successful CEOs will be those people who bring together the people, the processes and the partnerships together around new technologies to build those new revenue streams and transform your businesses before you are. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. We've got the handheld mics going around the room. Please put your hands in the air, get the attention of the people with the microphones. If there's any questions you'd like to ask Michael after that presentation. Mike, you, you're, you're talking about your, your Hewlett Packard moment. When I was at Triple J, they launched... IBM. They, oh, sorry, <laughs> IBM. When I, was at, when I was at Triple J, they launched uh, uh, Unearthed. And the way we'd go around the country looking for undiscovered bands. And the way Unearthed was originally done was we'd say over the radio, if you can hear us on 97.3 FM or 90.6 FM in Western Victoria, it's your turn. Send us your CDs and your tapes before this date. Mm -hmm. And each time we did it, like two days before, and we're going, okay, finally this idea has died. There's just mm -hmm. nothing's been sent in. And then the day before they do, like just giant mailbags would come in and, and we take all these CDs home and 90% of them were shit, they were awful. Yeah. <laughs> these days it's done as an online mm. entity of its own. 31 of the songs on this year's Hottest 100 were first played through the unearthed yeah. online portal. Isn't that great? Yeah. Just total mm. transformation in that space. Mm. You obviously get it. And when I was at the ABC, Mark Scott obviously got it. Mm. What's the challenge for CEOs in the room who don't instinctively get this stuff? Especially if they're part of that 30 to 37% you were saying. How yeah. hard, what can a CEO do if this is really not their natural game? Um, I think a lot of it starts with looking at your organisation's pain points. Where are your customers struggling in terms of interacting with you? How difficult or easy are you making it? And where are your employees struggling? What are their pain points? Because Often they're similar, and often your employees want to do the right thing by the customers, but you'd have pain points in your processes, in your systems, and that invariably gets shown on, on the customer side. Um, so getting people who can think strategically about what can you change, and particularly when you lay that over to where your industry is going and where your customers will go if you're not there, and how do you get from A to B is, is the critical part. So I think really, excuse me, thinking about um, who's likely to disrupt you and what are the things that you can do now to completely change your business because we know things like that, but your, even your Triple J example could never have happened with an without an entire digital platform where customers could interact with you versus you know, sticking a, a, a CD in a, in a mail bag going across the country. So that's part of it, I think, looking at pain points and, and where the industry is going. Just put your hands in there if you'd like to ask a question yourself, Michael. The, 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 the device thing I find fascinating because <clears throat> I'm a massive fan of the AFL and I would, I would watch my beloved Sydney Swans mo most often live. Yeah. I would watch them more on my phone wow. yeah. than I do on TV these mm. days. Mm. That's just, and the, 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 the Telstra AFL app's transformative like that. Mm. How big is it for people to get, when you're using that technology, to get workers in the field interacting real time and connectivity and device and all that. Have we moved far down that road yet or is there still a Abs long way to go? Absolutely, I mean, some of the things that I, I'm really proud of that our enterprise group is doing, if I take one of the recent ones, um, Queensland Ambulance Service. The AMBOs used to spend a lot of time on paperwork. So you'd turn up to a car accident or somebody's home and, and you'd you know deal with the patient, but then they'd have to deal with a lot of paperwork afterwards. And we gave every AMBO an iPad where they could just put everything in. And, and the minute you put an address in it, often if, if you'd been to that house before, it'd give you the history. They had so much at their fingertips, but they could also then access patient data, um, get more information about how to deal with, it instead, uh, deal with that patient instead of having to radio back into a local hospital, et cetera. Those sort of things are invaluable 
in terms of saving lives and, and making the job easier for the AMBO. Um, and so those sort of things in the field are really important. I could then talk about logistics or mining. Um, all of those sectors have completely transformed the way we can use the Internet of Things to um, um, connect into every vehicle, every uh, crate, everything that you're moving if you're in logistics or supply chain management, and to be able to collect that data and see where the pain points are in your business, where things are being held up, um, driver safety is improved dramatically because you know exactly how long the drivers have been on the road and what ro routes they're taking, etc. Um, so the efficiencies in those businesses and sectors can be completely transformed if you think about them differently. And I touched on it when I was talking about 5G. Some of those things around mining and, and logistics um, and broadcasting, 5G will mean, because of low latency, will be able to do things much faster. So if I take, say, mining as an example, we might have an automated truck today in, in a mine, but you can't actually um, have a series of trucks platooning, if you like, because if they're so close to each other, they're just going to run into each other. With 5G, with really low latency, it means you can have hundreds of automated vehicles in a mine at the same time, and, and they won't hit each other. And that's part of the autonomous vehicle evolution that will completely change the game. So what, if you take it back to your own business, your own sector, um, what can you use technology for to completely change the economics using robotics and artificial intelligence um, to, to change the game? I, I heard an example of recently, there's, there's people in China now observing data on Australian cattle when they're eating, when they're feeding, you know, their mm. sleep habits and all that. And so ordering cattle that haven't been born yet confident that the parents are healthy just looking yeah. so in pre-ordering cattle that are yet to be born mm. off the data you've got on the behavior of the parents that give you a 95 percent chance that thing's going to be completely healed that's i know it's unbelievable it's, just quickly a bit true. more on yeah. that the l word latency mm. explain for people who don't know what does it mean and how big and why is that why is the jump to 5g latency so important so latency the, the easiest way to think about it um imagine when you on your computer and you hit enter the, speed, or the time that it takes for that data to go back to a server and then back to you is the latency. So with 5G, that's going to be instantaneous. It'll be something like 1 25th of a second compared to where we are today in 4G. So that'll completely change the economics of it. Uh, and so with 5G, it's something like um, 25 times faster and it's got 25 more... Uh, 20 times more capacity in terms of bandwidth than 4G. Add that to the latency, it means things like artificial intelligence, uh, augmented reality, etc., will completely change what we can do with mobile technology. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I'm right. not a techo, so I was, that was my layman's version of it. But you're getting, <laughs> you're getting virtual real time when you make that jump. Absolutely, so yeah. And that's why things like automated vehicles will, you know, and we've been talking about automated cars for a long time, but, you know, most governments won't let Tesla or whoever um, put them on the road because of that latency factor. And once you get that latency fixed, it absolutely changes the game because you'll be instantaneous response time. So your vehicle will know within nanoseconds exactly how far you are from the vehicle in front of you. Very exciting stuff. Please give Michael a big round of applause. Michael Abid, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, mate. Thank you. Great, as always. We're moving now towards our morning tea break. It's going to be a prompt 25 minutes. Give me a couple of question moments of your time. Ever. While you're at morning tea, you might want to mull over this. It's our second top 100 quiz question. Open up your Twitter app. You need to have CEO Summit and top 100 as the hashtags. Here's the question. On the 11th of May 2018, an 81-year-old Aussie did something for the last time. Over the previous 60 years, he'd done this thing over a 1,000 times. And in doing so, it saved hundreds of thousands of lives. What did he do? What did he do? You can get a copy of my new book, Top 100, if you hashtag CO Summit and hashtag Top 100 with a correct answer to that. Once you've done that, once you've thought about that, hop on the app, check out the rest of the agenda, read up on the speaker bios, and don't forget that conversation function you have on the app where you can start a conversation with anyone else who's already here. 
Uh, the selfie bot is out there in the foyer, so you get a selfie taken with the selfie bot. Drop a business card into the King Living Lounge area if you'd like to go into the draw for the $1,000 voucher. And I want to have a big thanks to Pronto as our national sponsor for kicking us off today. So please another round of applause for Paul Bloxham and Michael Abid. We're off and running at CEO Summit.